Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Kalpin Modi. I'm the youth liaison here at the White House. We're joined today by Secretary Salazar uh, for a very special Open for Questions event on energy security. Uh, for folks who are joining online and watching this, we're joined by a great group of young people here at the White House in this room. We'll be taking some questions from them and certainly questions from you all. Uh, some of you submitted great questions online already. Uh, for others, if you go to the White House Facebook page um, and submit your questions there on the Facebook wall, uh, I can see them here and we'll answer as many of them as we can. Uh, Secretary, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much and uh, thank you to all the young people who are visiting uh, us here at the EOB in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, the President uh, last week addressed uh, the nation at Georgetown in a major energy speech in which he laid out uh, the energy blueprint for the future. At the heart of the President's uh, speech to the nation, he spoke about how we have to produce more and we have to use less uh, energy in America. On producing more energy, we need to broaden our energy portfolio by, by making sure that what we're doing is uh, developing oil and gas resources, but doing it in a safe and responsible way. And at the same time, while we're developing those resources, we also need to move forward with uh, the clean energy economy, which has been a beacon for this president uh, during his campaign as well as during the time that he has been president of the United States. In that vein, uh, he has uh, proposed that 80 percent of the electricity in the United States come from clean energy sources by the year 2035. Also because of the national security and economic security implications of how we use energy in our nation, it is important for our country to move forward to uh, capture uh, clean energy in a very major way for the United States and uh, to reduce the dependence on foreign oil. Uh, today we import about 11 million barrels of oil a day, 11 million barrels of oil a day to the United States. So the President laid out uh, as part of the agenda reducing the imports of foreign oil uh, by one-third by the year 2025. So we will reduce our dependence on foreign oil coming into this country uh, first by uh, producing more of our own domestic energy supplies in, in the right places in the right time. We don't believe that you ought to be drilling everywhere or that uh, drilling everywhere is going to give us the answer to the energy future of America that we need. But in addition to that, uh, expanding the portfolio of energy that we are using, including uh, a major enhancement in the biofuels programs for the country, uh, moving forward with uh, electric cars uh, for America with the goal of having a million all-electric cars on the roads of the United States by the year 2015, and moving forward to exploring other clean sources of energy to power America's economy as we move forward. We also know that uh, for the longest time, the United States has uh, used more energy than it should be using, and part of it is that we have not been efficient in how we have used our energy. And so through the efforts of the administration over the last year, uh, we are already saving millions of barrels of oil a year because we now have a standard where our cars are moving to the point where we will be able to achieve 35 miles per gallon on average for cars. And in the summer ahead, we'll have rules with respect to uh, efficiency for uh, trucks and uh, other vehicles that will allow us to continue moving forward with uh, better efficiency out of the vehicles that we, that we currently use. In addition to that, uh, we in the United States have not been very efficient with respect to how we use energy in our homes and in our buildings. And so the President uh, has moved forward with a very ambitious agenda to make our homes more efficient uh, with weatherization and with uh, uh, insulation that will make sure that we have more efficient homes as well as, as commercial buildings. When all is said and done, uh, the President's view is uh, that we can create, uh, through innovation and investment and, and technology and American ingenuity, a better future for all of America. And uh, that future has it, it has it as, as its keystone. Uh, the winning of the future of America really is about how we win the energy future of America. I just uh, returned uh, from uh, a uh, three-day trip that took me into uh, Brazil and into Mexico. Uh, Brazil is a great country uh, that gives us uh, an example of how we ought to be moving forward with our own energy portfolio. They, as a third world country with uh, 200 million people, are already an energy independent nation. So they have goals that uh, they are achieving where they want to have 47 percent of their energy coming from renewable energy resources. Ninety percent of the entire vehicle fleet system within the country of Brazil, this country of 200 million people, 90 percent of all their cars are already flex fuel. Gasoline 
is required to have a 25% biofuel mix in it before it can be sold. And on an impromptu, unannounced set of visits I made to a number of uh, gasoline stations in uh, Brazil, I was able to see how every gas station that you go to has pumps for ethanol, for gasoline, for different mixes of ethanol and gasoline, and for biodiesel. And so we need to uh, move forward with that kind of energy future, which the President uh, uh, envisions for the United States of America. And in so doing, uh, what we will address uh, is a key point that the President made, and that is that uh, there is no quick fix uh, to uh, the high price of gas today. Uh, the President recognizes, as does all of his cabinet, that there is pain at the pump, uh, that every time that uh, a uh, person who is filling up their uh, car at the gas station has to pay $50, $75, $100 $100 for gas, it hurts. And uh, that means that there may be less money to spend on food or on other kinds of uh, essentials. Uh, but transportation is essential, so the President recognizes the pain that the American people are going through, recognizes the pain as well uh, for farmers and ranchers who uh, spend so much of their uh, budget uh, dealing with uh, fuel costs as well as small businesses. And so the, the, the pain is there. The reality of it is that we cannot wave a, a magic wand and all of a sudden fuel prices are going to fall. Uh, we are where we are today uh, because we have had uh, 40 years of a failed energy policy of the United States. Uh, President Obama from day one has been committed to the new energy future of America. And his speech last week and laying out uh, the energy blueprint was an effort to let the nation know uh, what the road map for the future is for the United States. Uh, he is confident, uh, his team is confident uh, that we'll be able to get to that energy future for the United States. Uh, and we'll do it uh, by uh, making sure that uh, all of the people of the United States are involved and engaged with us as we move forward on uh, the new energy technologies of tomorrow. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, online, we've got uh, a number of great questions or a bunch of topics that are sort of trending here, uh, some more contentious than others. So I think we should, we should dive right in. And uh, I'll ask you the first question, which was actually submitted right at the top here um, from Christopher, Christopher Carroll. And the, the question is maybe a nice way to set the, the tone here. Um, a lot of folks are wondering, it's clear that a number of administrations, Carter, Reagan, Clinton, et cetera, have sought out the challenge of seeking better energy security and reducing the United States' dependency on oil. How does this administration intend on dealing with that challenge with reflection on how and why perhaps other administrations have failed to do so? Uh, we believe what, what has happened in the past, and this has been both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations, is that they have essentially lulled themselves into complacency, as the American people have as well, with the uh, rise and fall of gas prices. If you have a spike in gas prices, all of a sudden it's uh, the issue of the day. And so there's a lot of concern. Uh, the Congress says we have to fix this problem now. We have to drive gas prices uh, down today. But when you look back uh, at the history of different administrations, Richard Nixon coining the term energy independence, Jimmy Carter talking about becoming energy independent with the moral imperative of war, uh, the days of Ronald Reagan where there was no attention really paid to energy efficiency or renewable energy, and even during the Clinton administration we didn't do uh, what should have been done relative to this uh, new energy future. In those 40 years we went from importing 30% of our oil to almost 70% of our oil. Uh, we're back down in part because of the fuel efficiency programs that we've started where we're now importing just about 50 percent of our oil. Now they failed in the past because they didn't keep a sustained uh, focused view on the long term. And that was a key part of what the President was trying to do in his speech uh, last week was to say there are no quick fixes uh, but we have a blueprint uh, that has a broad portfolio of energy sources as well as energy efficiency as well as innovation uh, initiatives that will get us to achieve these long-term goals. So it's not easy for the President of the United States to commit himself to say we will reduce our imports of foreign oil by one-third. Uh, but this President has done that, and uh, we believe that we can get it done. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, who's got a question from in the room here? Go ahead. Why don't you introduce us, let, let us know where you're from. <coughs> That's right, we have a mic coming around so the folks at home can hear. There you go. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Rust. I'm a uh, freshman at Purdue University. And uh, agriculture employs over 20% of the American workforce. And so it's, uh, it's a very necessary part of the American economy and security. And it's, it's been obvious that it's um, been a very good venue for renewable energy sources. 
Um, what efforts are being done to make sure that we are using agriculture as a source for energy and, and a way to keep the American farmers going? Joe, uh, it's a very good question. And uh, let me say uh, this president and, and the administration from day one have uh, seen a key part of our energy future as growing our way uh, to that energy future and energy independence. And it's particularly important uh, because uh, rural America is a place where uh, rural America can do much better if they're helping us contribute in a significant way to that energy future. So the biofuels program, uh, which uh, the president has initiated, which uh, Secretary Vilsack and the Department of Agriculture has been working very hard on, contemplates that biofuels will be a significant uh, part of our energy portfolio for the future. In the president's uh, statement of last week, he announced we'll have four uh, operational uh, uh, advanced uh, biofuels, uh, biorefineries uh, that we will uh, begin uh, in the next two years. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time working on this. Uh, part of what we have done as well is uh, we have moved up the amount of, uh, of uh, biofuels that are included now in gasoline mixes from E10 up to E15, which basically means that 15% of the mixture is essentially coming from biofuels. So it is a great opportunity for America to grow our way to energy independence and uh, something the President strongly believes in. Great. Thank you, sir. We've got two questions that are, that are actually very similar uh, here, so I'm going to read them both, and there are a number of others on a similar topic. A lot of folks uh, think that we should expand our drilling here in the United States, and so D. Greenmeyer asks, why don't we stop depending on other countries for our oil? Why can't we drill for our own? And Barbara Rolf wants to know, uh, she says, I, I think we need to drill for our own oil. We really need to get the fuel prices down. Not, not only am I paying more at the pump, I'm paying almost double at the grocery store. So are, are, are these things that we're doing and are these viable solutions? Do they really tackle the problem? Yep. Uh, Dee, who was the second question from? Uh, Barbara. Dee and, and Barbara. Uh, so Dee and Barbara, what I would uh, say to you is the following. Uh, first, uh, we do believe that we should produce uh, more of our energy here at home. And so we are doing that with respect to opening up uh, areas and uh, supporting a drilling program, uh, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, where we're issuing a number of uh, drilling permits to increase the, num the, the amount of oil that we're producing. On the onshore area, where uh, we control about 700 million acres, we issued 5,000 drilling permits this year. We expect to issue 7,000 more next year. So we see oil and gas as part of uh, the energy portfolio. That's been uh, an unquestioned point of view of the president from the very beginning. But if we really are going to uh, grasp uh, the future of, uh, of energy for our nation, we need to diversify our energy portfolio. Uh, there's no way that with 2% of the world's reserves of uh, oil that we're going to solve our energy problems for the future. And that's why biofuels and uh, other clean energy uh, is very important to our energy future for the United States. So drilling is a part of it, but it's not the answer. And so for those who have said that uh, Drill, baby, drill is really the answer to our uh, energy uh, challenges. Uh, from our point of view, uh, uh, that's not correct. And in fact, uh, that's part of the reason why past administrations have failed to get us to the energy independence that we want and why we became so over-dependent on foreign oil, because we just don't have those resources here at home. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience? My name is David Olson. I'm from uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a resident of uh, the state of Illinois. My question was similar to Joe's question uh, on the same topic. You, know, you talked a lot about uh, increasing biofuels and then pain at the pump, but there's also a lot of concern that by increasing biofuels, we're reducing the amount of uh, products, agricultural products that go towards food, which has led to increases, pr increases in prices for food. So how is the administration dealing with uh, that balance between producing um, by corn and other products uh, for food and for energy? You know, it's, uh, it's a very good question, David. The uh, way in which we are doing it is by uh, recognizing that there are limitations to what we can do with respect to uh, ethanol, which is corn-based ethanol. And we know that at some point in time, you reach a, a level where uh, using corn uh, for ethanol uh, brings up the prices of food in a way that would be unacceptable. And so there's a limit that we have imposed on how much will actually come from corn ethanol. And where we really see the future, and what is a really exciting future, is through advanced biofuels, where you can take uh, uh, any kind of biotic uh, matter, uh, matter uh, including uh, places where you have a lot of biomass 
being created in places like the southeastern part of the United States and with uh, wood chips and any kind of biomass essentially be able to convert uh, that uh, biomass over to cellulosic uh, ethanol. That's where the future really lies and uh, those are the kinds of, uh, of uh, research and development programs uh, which we have supported, have initiated and, and frankly have several of those research facilities which are being built and being uh, brought online in places like Georgia. So we think the future uh, for biofuels uh, is beyond corn. It really is uh, dealing with uh, advanced uh, biofuels where we uh, broaden the portfolio of feedstocks that we currently are using uh, in the ethanol market. Okay. Uh, Joe Haas online has a question. He says, Mr. Secretary, how can an alternative, alternative energy infrastructure be created during these tough economic times? And his comment is that, that if we rely on privatization, we create new monopolies. Um, do you want to elaborate on the, on the first part, which is, is basically, uh, given the tough economic times, how are these sorts of things incentivized? You know, Joe, uh, we have to make sure that we have uh, the distrib distribution uh, capacity and there are ways in uh, which we can incentivize that at a, at, a, at a very low cost. And let me just give you a couple of examples. Brazil, which is a poor nation, yes, 200 million people and last year growing by 7.5% with a huge future, uh, has 90% of all its vehicles equipped with uh, flex fuel technology. And that's because it doesn't cost very much at all to put the flex fuel chip into your uh, carburetor of your car. And so that then creates, uh, it with, with very low costs, the opportunity for them to diversify their fuel choice uh, within the Brazilian economy. So they've already done that in that very uh, poor country. In uh, the uh, fuel stations that I visited, and these were not uh, announced visits, it just happened that I wanted to see how Petrobras was operating in Brazil. I was amazed how they have uh, pumps that can give you everything from biodiesel to ethanol to, the, to gasoline to the different fuel mixtures. Uh, we can do that here in this country as well. So I don't think that the, the I don't think it's the financial uh, limitations. I think there are other interests that uh, are brought to bear that basically have kept us from moving forward with creating the kind of distribution system that is required to have diversity in uh, the uh, energy sources of the U.S. And I believe that we can do that. Great. Um, we have another question here. Yeah, and let, oh, let me just add sure. an, another another if I, another uh, comment on that, Joe. I think to not do it is. Uh, is, is foolhardy economically for us because right now we have a hundred uh, we have a hundred dollar a barrel oil we are sending billions and billions of dollars out of the United States into other countries and if we were able to keep more of that money here uh, it would create a better economy in the United States uh, so we create economic wealth here in the US instead of import instead of exporting it to other places. So I think the amount of investment that is uh, necessary is far outweighed by the benefits ultimately to the United States economy. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions trending. There's uh, one from Robert Bostick and was seconded by Kyle Lutz. They want to know, um, this, is, this is actually, let me preface this by saying there are a number of trends here about alternate, uh, alternative energies and clean, clean energies. Uh, and this question is, there is more energy in ocean currents than in any other energy source. Why are we not investing in it? We, we are investing in uh, renewable energies in the offshore. Uh, probably the greatest potential uh, instead of ocean energy uh, right now is, uh, is uh, wind energy off the Atlantic and in the Gulf and even off the Pacific. So the uh, states along the Atlantic, uh, for example, have come together in, under a consortium that we've created with the governors uh, of those states. And what we're doing is looking at the possibility of standing up offshore wind here in the United States. Uh, they've done it in the UK, they've done it in Norway, they've done it in Denmark, uh, they, and so there's no reason why we can't do it here. And uh, while we have, now we're uh, creating about 10,000 megawatts of power, which is a, a lot of power, just from wind energy in the last uh, two years all onshore. The potential is uh, uh, a thousand fold uh, with respect to what we do in the Atlantic. And so we have a major initiative with respect to wind on ocean currents themselves. Uh, we have a lot of uh, research and development that's going on there, but uh, the technology is not there today for us to be able to say that we're going to be able to capture wave action and ocean currents within uh, two, three, four, five years. 
uh, we believe we can do it in the oceans on wind and that we can do that in the next several years. Thank you. We have another question here over in the back. My name is Will Fisher. I'm from American University. First time? Uh, Will. Will Fisher. Will. Uh, thank you for having us here, uh, thank Mr. You, Will. Secretary. Uh, my question is about natural gas. Um, we've seen in the past couple of years some very impressive in increases in shale gas technology that have really scaled up our domestic sources of, of natural gas. Um, so with respect to that, where do you see natural gas in our future energy mix, specifically the electrical mix, um, since it is kind of a domestic source for power? Well, uh, we are working hard to make sure that uh, natural gas is a significant part of our energy portfolio for the future for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, it is uh, very abundant in the United States as a domestic energy source. It doesn't have to be imported from anywhere. Uh, two, it's abundant today because of the technologies that have been developed with horizontal drilling and other measures that uh, it is about 25 percent the cost of, uh, of oil. Uh, for the same energy equivalent. So 25% of the cost uh, of oil. That's an important uh, statistic to keep in mind. And so the President uh, supports uh, moving forward the robust natural gas uh, industry and supports the conversion of, for example, uh, long haul trucks over to using natural gas because it will lessen the amount of oil that we're importing from other countries and converting uh, plants which are not climate friendly now that produce electricity over to natural gas because it's a lot cleaner as a burning fuel. Uh, so we are moving forward uh, with that agenda. Uh, there is uh, one caution and one caveat which we often talk about and that's um, there is concern uh, about what's happening with hydraulic fracking uh, on natural gas uh, development because uh, in states like New York and New Jersey there are, have already been moratoria that have been put into place because people are concerned that when you uh, fracture the reservoirs to be able to bring up the natural gas, you're injecting uh, chemicals into the underground that could cause uh, pollution for the long term and harm water quality. And so we are examining ways in uh, which uh, hydraulic fracking uh, can be done in a safe way and also examining ways in which uh, the people in the area uh, or the people of the United States who are interested in knowing what those chemicals are that are being injected into the underground will have knowledge of what those chemicals are. You know, transparency is a key principle of uh, uh, this administration and uh, so we will continue to figure out a way of supporting the natural gas uh, future of America but at the same time doing it in a way that's safe and that people of the United States feel that it's uh, safely being produced. We've got two more questions here. Uh, one is from Tom Sadler. The other one is from uh, Camille uh, Thorndike and they're they're both uh, with regard to public land. Um, the first uh, is Secretary Salazar, sportsmen like me are concerned that large-scale solar development on public lands will damage the sporting opportunities and wildlife populations in the West. Can you help protect our hunting and fishing heritage by ensuring that the projects are clustered appropriately? And then Camilla's question, which is similar, Secretary Salazar, how does this administration intend to protect the ecological and visual integrity of public lands in the face of mounting pressure for energy exploration? Those are, uh, are very, very good questions. And uh, what we are doing is um, we have developed a concept that we call smart from the start. And uh, smart from the start essentially means that uh, we want to site uh, solar facilities as well as wind facilities in places where it makes sense. Uh, so you don't want to have, for example, a large uh, wind farm or a uh, solar farm uh, in the vicinity of a national park like Arches National Park in Utah. Uh, and you don't want to have them sited in places where they are going to come into conflict with uh, important uh, wildlife habitat. And so what we are doing is uh, going through on the solar side a programmatic environmental impact statement that essentially is looking at the 250 uh, million or so acres that we have in the public domain under the Bureau of Land Management and deciding where within those areas, it makes the most sense for us to site uh, solar energy projects. Uh, I will say that I believe we can do it in a way that uh, doesn't create conflicts with uh, wildlife and that preserves the ecological value of these public lands. I'm proud of the fact that uh, just in 2010 alone, the Department of Interior, under the President's direction and support, was able to authorize uh, about 3,700 megawatts of solar energy power on our public lands. 
that's uh, the equivalent amount of uh, generation that would come from 10 to 12 uh, mid-size uh, coal-fired power plants. And uh, it demonstrates another part of the portfolio, which is important to the country, that we can capture the power of the sun to help us uh, power our electric vehicles and to help us power our homes. Great. We've got enough time for about one more round of questions, so let me take one that came in uh, at the top here. Um, that's from uh, Lindy Lickster. She says, uh, why don't we increase the use of public transport for metropolitan areas, and why don't we install electric bike drop-offs in cities instead of using the bus? Uh, we should, and uh, we, in fact, are through uh, the President's uh, investments in the recovery program. We're doing much more in mass transit than has uh, been done uh, probably in 100 years uh, here in this country. So we see mass transit and uh, mass transportation as being a, a very important part of the agenda. And ultimately, uh, when you look at uh, bike usage, uh, you know, it's good for people's health. Uh, it's great for fuel efficiency. And at the end of the day, uh, it uh, seems to me it will be a very bright part of our future. And I think across American cities, and it's another thing that I think is important to point out, that uh, we are a laboratory of uh, new ideas uh, through our communities uh, throughout our country. And uh, many communities that I visit now have uh, the kinds of uh, vehicle uh, rentals uh, for, for bicycles that essentially allow you to use bikes in a way that is good for people's health and uh, is good for, uh, for, for America's energy future. And if I may, since uh, I think we're running out of time here, uh, just make one more quick uh, comment. Uh, the America's Great Outdoors Program, which is uh, the President's conservation initiative, is uh, very near and dear to my heart. And uh, we worked on it very hard under the President's leadership. And uh, you will see a lot more of that coming uh, in the years ahead. But it will include a new generation of urban parks and uh, wildlands for America because most of our population now lives in urban areas. We'll see a focus on preserving the great rural landscapes from the crown of the continent to the Everglades uh, in Florida. And we'll see the uh, attention of uh, the government uh, turned over to protecting uh, the rivers of America in a very good way. And the last thing that is really important out of that presidential initiative is that we see it as essential to engage the young people of America in what we do in conservation. And so in my department alone this year, uh, in 2010, just the last year, we had 21,000 young people who were working in our department. And it was important because they helped us do our job at the Department of Interior. And it also taught uh, the next generation of conservation leaders uh, some of the things that uh, we are doing uh, for conservation in America. So uh, there's a, a nexus, frankly, between energy, which I know was the focus of uh, this uh, conversation, and what we do with uh, conservation as well. And so we're trying to bring them together in a way that, uh, that fits well. I'm glad you brought that up, sir. For folks watching at home that, that want to plug in on this, uh, uh, roughly about once a week, we send out from the White House uh, a newsletter for young Americans that you can get in your inbox. And we frequently uh, send links over to this initiative, um, particularly how it affects young people and how you all can plug in. So if you'd like to sign up for that, just go to whitehouse.gov slash young Americans. I'll give you that link again when we wrap up, um, but you can sign up for that list and, and get all these links as well. Um, so one more question from in the room. Where's a young lady? We haven't heard from a young lady yet. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Katie. Um, I'm from American University here in Washington, D.C., and um, I'm glad you address things like conservation and fracking. Um, and I, I, you've talked a lot about how um, we're becoming energy efficient using our own natural gas and drilling um, onshore here in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I'm just wondering how, uh, what you would say to, say, environmentalists who are worried about um, the environmental costs and effects of um, continuing to drill, drill in oil here and using uh, natural gas. Um, some would say that the environmental effects of that are outweigh um, really being energy um, efficient and energy independent here in America. So what would you say to those that are worried about the environmental effects of continuing to drill for oil and using natural gas? You know, Katie, I would uh, say to the environmental organizations uh, with whom I speak <laughs> fre frequently, both in my office as well as in some of their uh, conventions, and that is that uh, we want to move forward to a clean energy future for the United States of America. That's, that's where the real game change is. Uh, that's how we're going to win the future for the United States. But we can't get there overnight. Uh, there have been uh, too many decades, in fact, uh, probably a century where uh, we've been going in another direction. So what the President is attempting to do is to change the direction of the Titanic. And, and we are making uh, significant progress. But you can't do it overnight. 
and uh, the consequence of essentially stopping drilling or stopping uh, the use of coal, for example, in coal-fired power plants would be to damage our economy uh, in a, to a point where uh, we can't afford to do that. You know, we can't afford to go back uh, to the days of uh, the Great Depression and you know, one of the, the biggest challenges domestically which uh, the President and the country have faced have been the economic challenges of the last two years where uh, we were in an essential economic meltdown when the President was inaugurated into office. The economy seems to be coming out of the ditch and uh, we feel good about the indicators of where we're going. It's going to take a while uh, for us to get out of that ditch and for us to make uh, a complete uh, uh, U-turn from uh, drilling and, and other important energy uh, 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 part of the energy portfolio that powers our economy today, uh, in our view, would, uh, would, be in, would go in the, in the wrong direction. But we're making progress and I think that the important thing to note is uh, on fuel efficiency and uh, moving in with uh, biofuels and a whole set of other parts of the energy portfolio, we have already made historic progress in the last two years. We recognize, obviously, we have a lot more to go. You know, our work has just begun, but uh, we're confident about the future and uh, believe that uh, in your time, uh, you will see an America that is uh, powered uh, by an energy which is very different than uh, the economy that I have seen for most of my lifetime. Great question. Um, let's wrap this up with a question that I think is summarized pretty well with all the different trends that we've seen today. We've got a ton of people saying that they want more drilling, that they, they think we should really open it up a lot more than uh, the, the blueprint suggests. We have other folks who are, who are really critical of why we're drilling in the first place, saying that we should make stronger investments now. Um, and this question from Joe uh, Mama, uh, perhaps summarizes both of them, <laughs> uh, which is why wait till 2025 to implement our reduction of dependence on foreign oil? Uh, why not do it now? Yeah, Joe, I think if uh, we could do it now, we would do it. If uh, we could move honestly to a point where we were importing no oil, uh, we frankly would do it. But for the lights that are powering this room, for uh, the gas that is being used uh, in uh, your car or your family's car or your friend's cars, uh, we need to continue to uh, have that energy to power our economy and to essentially try to turn the switch uh, in that dramatic fashion that would dramatically hurt the standing and, and power of the United States today and that's not what we want to do. Uh, we're confident that we can do this uh, in the right way uh, but it's going to take uh, some time. Uh, the President uh, in his speech at Georgetown uh, last week spoke about how this is a problem which uh, doesn't have a quick fix. He also said that this is a problem which will not be solely solved on his watch, uh, that it's going to have to be continued beyond uh, his, uh, his, his presidency. And uh, that's because it is such a huge issue. And what's happened in the past is that uh, every time you have a gas price hike, people get all excited about it, and then the country goes back to sleep. Uh, this time, this president, with this blueprint, uh, intends to make sure that we have a long-term framework so that we fr finally solve the problem and challenge of America's energy future. Thank you, sir. I uh, wanted to thank folks that are joining us uh, online, um, our friends here in the room from universities in, uh, here in Washington, D.C., and all through the Midwest, the Association of Big Ten Schools that have joined us today. Um, if folks want more information, uh, and if you'd like to partner to continue this conversation, uh, go to whitehouse.gov slash youngamericans. Uh, you can get information on the initiatives that we discussed here if you sign up for the newsletter. And perhaps most importantly, you can download a toolkit to host a roundtable similar to this uh, in your own community, whether it's a campus, a community center, a local restaurant or diner, uh, get a group of folks together and, uh, and, and go forward with the conversation. So whitehouse.gov slash youngamericans if you'd like to partner. And of course, uh, all the information about the president's policies are at whitehouse.gov. So thank you all so much for joining us. On, until next time, Secretary Salazar, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for your leadership and thank you to all the young people who have joined us here as well as all the young people who are online. It makes me proud and it inspires me every day, probably more so than uh, anything you ever know. And uh, we work on tough issues, but our inspiration really comes from your generation. Thank you.